got reports. So, okay, good. Okay, doc. And this one today. Let me see. Today we will be talking about are you sabotaging your diet, your health with your diet? We will talk about digestion and absorption. What's in our food? And I will now. Hello, somebody else came in. Welcome. We are just beginning. What's up with my belly? Number two. And what you will learn today is what the foods we eat consist of. Fats, protein, carbohydrates, vitamins, minerals, additives. How they look, how they get digested, how they get absorbed by the bodies, and what effect they have on your health. And what is a leaky gut and what to do about it. But I will talk later about that again. And about common pitfalls in our diet and how to avoid them. And I will talk a little bit about drug mothers, drugs which affect digestion and absorption. I'll talk about that in later seminars again. So a little bit about housekeeping. You can ask questions anytime via the chat feature. I know I muted you when you came in, so uh, I can talk. <laughs> if you want to watch the seminar again, or for those who cannot make it to the live event, there will be a recording available after the event. And feel free to share the link, my newsletter, my website with your friends and family. And if there's anybody that wants to see it, uh, just send me their email and I'll add them to the list. The material in this presentation, of course, is copyrighted, the usual. Uh, share it if you share it, put a link back to my website or email address. And of course, I'm not diagnosing medical advice giving in this seminar. It's just for informational purposes. Thank you all for watching today and coming. Now, I will talk a little bit about who I am and about me and what I do. Stuff you maybe didn't know. Now, my former German life, I was born and raised in Ulm in Southwest Germany. And at four years old, I knew I wanted to be a healer. And I wanted to get the same stuff that my brother got. He got uh, construction uh, uh, stuff. And I got teddy bears and dolls as a girl. So what do I do? Uh, the teddy bear made a sound, so I cut it open and checked what the sound was. <laughs> My mother didn't like that. I had to sew it back again, so I learned to sew at the same time. And I did the same to the doll, but it couldn't be put back together. Eventually, I grew up and studied medicine in Ulm and in Hanover, Germany. I married, raised two sons. And uh, I helped and worked in the family practice of my ex-husband. So I'm nearly a family doctor too. Eventually I became a specialist for dermatology, which is skin diseases, sexually transmitted diseases, autoimmune diseases in Germany. For allergies and natural medicine and leg vein diseases. I founded my own office and worked for several years with a growing team, which was fun in the beginning, but I had problems. In Germany, you need a lot of patients to make ends meet. For dermatologists, it was about 80 a day. So I was unsatisfied and very frustrated by the conventional approach. I had a six-month wait list to see me, and then I had to do a five-minute medicine. That's no fun. My marriage was not happy. I got sick. My back got bad. I got depressed. I ended up having to sell my practice. Then the ex-husband passed away and I moved with my teenage sons to Halifax in 1997. Best decision of my life. Well, a new life in Nova Scotia. And I, when I came, I was zapped. My whole body and mind broke down. I was sick, fat, depressed, tried to kill myself. God help. Found my sweetheart. I'm with him now for 18 years. And I started to take courses, research, work on myself, and a lot of all of that. I rebuilt my own health in the past 10 to 15 years, met many amazing people. I'm feeling better than ever, and I love to meet people, hear their stories, do research, learn and explore new things, and I share my love and knowledge to help others. I have hobbies. I like to read. I like science. 
And I like to cook. We have a nice backyard with chickens, a garden, and we have two little Pomeranian dogs. Now the difference, the left picture shows me in 2005 and 11 years later, I think I look better, <laughs> you judge. Now, what is in our food? And you have heard about all the different food pyramids and plates that try to explain to you what to eat. This is just an example of the Harvard food pyramid. And they say daily exercise and weight control. Now that's not that easy as they say. Weight control is not that easy. Then you should eat this stuff. And then when you go to the next one, there's the eat well plate that they have in the UK. And I like that there's many more vegetables here. I like that. There's carbs a lot. There's milk and milk products. There's uh, Foods and drinks high in fat and sugar that you shouldn't eat too much. And there's meat, fish, eggs, beans. Mm. Okay, now what I think is better for many people, especially those that have trouble with their stomach, is a bio-individual diet that uh, accounts for their sensitivities. Many people with stomach issues are gluten intolerant. That's why the gluten-free grains and legumes are right up here. Uh, if they eat regular grain, they get problems. And it depends very much on the quality of the food what you eat. Grass-fed beef, I like meat from animals that are fed what they naturally eat and that can roam in an environment that is as natural as possible. So our chickens have the whole backyard to roam, which I like. And then bone broth is good to drink, is good for the stomach. Fermented food is good for many people, not for all. Same sprouts have a lot of nutrition. And later on, I'll make little cooking videos and show you how to do it easy. Of course, there is uh, raw food, which is often critical with belly issues. And juicing, I'm not too much a fan from because you lose all the fiber, but you can also put it in a smoothie in your mixer. Now, vegetables is one of the biggest, most important food groups for everybody. Cooked, raw, whatever. Meat, eggs, pastured eggs, grass-fed meat, wild caught, caught uh, fish, pastured chicken, and if you eat pork, if possible, eat pastured pork from pork that can roam outside. And fats is often very important. It's very important to eat the right fats. I'll talk about that later. Fruits in moderation. Oops, that was me, sorry. Fruits in moderation. Nuts and seeds if tolerated. And if tolerated, milk products, if tolerated, starchy vegetables and dairy foods. So that's, that's, that's often the best, but I like to look at the whole person and then devise a diet that's individual, bio-individual for their needs. Now, what does food really consist of? We all have heard of the carbohydrates, which are sugars and starches. Those are energy providers. They are not necessary for life, which most people don't know. We can live without carbohydrates if we have to. For example, when we go on a fasting uh, episode, the body breaks down fats into ketones that the body can use for energy. Then we have proteins. Those are the building blocks of muscles and cells. And some building blocks from proteins called amino acids are actually essential for life. We cannot make them ourselves. So it's very important to get the right amount and the right quality of proteins. Then fats are the building blocks of cells and the brain. 60% of our brain is fat and most of it cholesterol. And there are, of course, energy storage with everybody that has a little belt around their middle nose. And they are also energy providers. That means, oops, is there anything that I should look at? I'm not quite sure. 
Okay, let's go for now. And uh, examples for carbohydrates are oats, bread, noodles, potatoes. And examples for protein rich food is milk, beans, meat, cheese, fish, eggs, nuts. Some of them are high in fat also, and some of those fats are good. And we'll go on that later. Then what is fats? Fats are cooking oils, butter, margarine, uh, fatty fish like mackerel, sardines, anchovies, uh, herring, uh, peanuts, nuts, nut butters, avocado. Now let's get a little bit more into it. That is a little repetition from last time, an overview about the digestive system. The digestive system starts in the mouth. You have to chew your food well. It uh, then goes in the large and small intestines before it gets eliminated. And there's accessory organs, which are mainly for digestion, the liver and the pancreas, that uh, <clears throat> help digest the foods. And we'll go a little bit closer into that, but not too much because it's very complicated. Now, what is the function of the liver and gallbladder in digestion? Uh, the liver is a metabolic powerhouse and a chemistry factory. We cannot live without a liver. That's when they take a liver for a person living a liver transplant, they only can take half. The other part has to be left in the body and grows actually back. I don't know if you heard from the Greek mythology about Prometheus that had an eagle uh, eat at his liver and it grew back every day. <laughs> it's kind of interesting. I like to read that as a kid. The liver produces bile approximately a liter a day, which is stored in the gallbladder. So the gallbladder would be here on the underside of the liver. Oops, sorry. And released in the gut. There, there we are back. I, I sometimes push the arrow too much. Bile is really a mixture of water, bile salts, bile pigments, phospholipids such as lecithin, electrolytes, cholesterol, and triglycerides, and it emulsifies fats to make it possible for them to be digested in the watery environment of the bowels. And the principle of emulsifications, you all know when you try to get rid of a fat, a fatty streak on your dishes and you use dish detergent which is an emulsifier just like bile and what happens to the bile the bile goes gets stored in the gallbladder if somebody doesn't have a gallbladder the bile can't get stored but it still gets from the liver into the bowels but it gets digested all the time and it gets uh, uh, secreted all the time and uh, leads often to problems with very fatty meal. Now a few words about the pancreas, which is a very underappreciated organ. It's in the middle of your body, behind the stomach, a little to the left, and it produces insulin, which we mostly know because it regulates glucose. There's other glucose regulating hormones. That is the endocrine function. And you see it down here, those are the where's my arrow? Here, those are the blue areas. They are called islet cells because they are kind of isolated, but they are connected to the bloodstream, but not to the digestive system. But the pancreas also produces very important pancreatic juices, which contain salts, sodium bicarbonate, to uh, neutralize the acid from the stomach, and several digestive enzymes proteases that uh, break down proteins, lipases break down lipids, amylases break down starches, and nucleases break down cellular components. That is the exocrine function, and we cannot live without it either. The exocrine function is regulated by hormones made by the stomach and duodenal cells, that is part of the uh, small intestine, and the nervous system. So it's quite, quite complex and interesting. Next, we'll talk a little bit about digestion and absorption of carbohydrate foods. It's interesting to see 
the sweetness comparison of carbohydrates. Now standardized it is to sugar, sucrose, that's the table sugar, is number 100. Glucose is less sweet than table sugar. Galactose, which is the milk sugar, one of the milk sugars, is even less sweeter. And fructose is the sweetest of them all, which is in small amounts in fruit, and in large amounts in candy and everything that contains, for example, high fructose corn syrup. That is a very unhealthy food because the sugar in sucrose, fructose, whatever you eat and it's very sweet, that sweetness gets transmitted to the brain and stimulates the brain centers the same as if you had cocaine. So it, people get addicted to sugar. Now, starch is not sweet and fiber is not sweet. Even babies are programmed to like sweetness. And although starch by itself doesn't taste sweet, its digestion begins in the mouth, where the enzyme amylase breaks it down in simple sugars. And that's why you eat, when you eat white bread and chew it, it usually gets a little sweeter. Now, what happens with the saliva? Saliva is very important for digestion because it not only makes it possible that you swallow the food without it getting stuck, but they, the salivary glands are all around your mouth and simple starches is broken down by chewing, as we said, but whole grains are broken down much slower and mostly in the stomach and the fiber keeps the feeling fuller longer. And that's why usually it's recommended to eat complex starches and fiber. Now that is a little complicated, the carbohydrate breakdown. I'll just jump over it. Only 5% of starches are digested in the mouth though. So that is interesting. And in the stomach itself, the starches are not digested because it's too acidic, but the pancreatic amylase, the enzymes from the pancreas, they break down the remaining starch and the rest of the carbs. And in the small intestine, they get, uh, the sugars get uh, break broken down into smaller parts and some people do not produce enough lactase which is lactose intolerance they can't drink milk that has lactose in it now what happens to the proteins that we eat now when you look at the left picture here the protein digestion begins in the stomach by hydrochloric acid and the enzyme pepsin so there you can see if you take and acids, especially proton pump inhibitors, and if you take a lot of them, so your stomach acid is non-existent, you stop or inhibit greatly the protein digestion. So that can lead to deficiencies. Now what happens after the stomach, say you have some acid, uh, the protein digesting enzymes are secreted from the pancreas into the small intestine. And the small intestine is a major site of protein digestion. The final digestion occurs here and it gets absorbed there too. The liver regulates actually the distribution of amino acids that get entered uh, and absorbed in the small intestines uh, to the rest of the body. Every blood, sorry, Every blood uh, that, uh, everything that gets absorbed, every nutrient that gets absorbed in the digestion, all the blood from the intestinal system, the veins from it that go back to the heart have to go first through the liver and get filtered and get chemically break and broken down. So the same happens to your medications also. That's why medications sometimes have to be given by an IV or by injection if it doesn't get absorbed. A small amount of dietary protein gets lost in the stool. And what happens exactly to the proteins you see here, this one is a schema that, that bothers me. It's a schema of the cells in this, on the outside of the small intestine. 
It's called the brush border membrane because uh, the little uh, valleys and hills look like a brush that increases the surface where you can reabsorb and absorb food. And most uh, food protein get broken down by pancreas enzymes to little uh, building blocks of proteins called peptides. And those peptides get broken down to the basic building blocks that are called amino acids. And those amino acids go either through the cell by specialized transport mechanisms, or sometimes in a minor way, they go in between the cells. And now that has consequences in leaky gut, and I'll talk to that about a little later, when those connections between the cells get loose and bigger proteins can go through. Now, what happens to the fats? Now, that's quite interesting. When you eat a fatty food on the left side, it goes in the stomach, it goes to the duodenum, and then it gets emulsified by the bile and gets digested and broken down into free fatty acids, which you see on the right side, monoglycerides and cholesterol. And that gets transported into the cells and then either put in little packages called microns and go into the lymph vessels, into the lymph nodes, or it goes into the bloodstream and from there into the liver. And the liver makes the proteins that encapsulate and emulsify in a way the fats and are transport proteins to transport lipids in the blood. And the most known of them is the so-called HDL, high-density lipoprotein, which is uh, called the good, pro, uh, good fat, good blood fat. And then there's the LDL, the so-called bad blood fat. But really, there's two types of LDL. There's a large fluffy particles that are harmless, and there's a small dense particles. And those actually uh, cause cholesterol to deposit in your arteries. Now, what is fat good for, really? We were always told fat makes you fat, which we now know is not true. And we also know that not all calories are made the same. Whether you eat a sugar calorie or a fat calorie does not have the same effect on your metabolism. Same with protein. And that's why the Atkins system can work for certain people. Now, we have here a schema of a, a cut of a cell, and here's a cell, uh, the, the middle of the cell, the nucleus, and here's the cell membrane. And all cells, sorry, all cells have membranes, and that is a, 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 a cut, an enlargement of a membrane. And those little blue globules are the outside membrane zone and the inside membrane surface. And they are made up out of cholesterol, which are the little uh, yellow globs. They are made out of uh, amino acids, out of uh, sugar proteins that contain certain uh, uh, sugars, and uh, carbohydrate chains, of course. Then phospholipids, those are, again, fats. And they form a bilayer that makes it on the outside uh, water soluble and in the inside of the cell fat soluble. And then you have the large pink ones which are proteins and those are often transporters and channels that look after the transport of different nutrients into the cells where they get needed to produce your energy and movement of the muscles and thinking in the brain. So with no cholesterol and no fat there is no brain function. And there's actually a link that if people get uh, too many fat-lowering drugs, they have a higher risk for dementia. Now, what's good fats? Good fats, what I say, what I consider, and most people now consider, is extra virgin olive oil. And you recognize it be not Many olive oil you buy in the store, even if it's extra virgin, cold pressed, first pressing, even then it's adulterated. So you recognize a good olive oil 
by the color. It should be a little greenish. And the taste, it should be a little sharp, not too sharp if you don't like it, but it should be a little sharp. Then good for you is avocados. And to a certain degree, avocado oil is fine if you don't like the taste of coconut or virgin oil. It's, avocado oil is one of the oils that is good for frying. Then there's organic virgin coconut oil. You actually can get it in a bulk bun or at Costco. Uh, in, in good quality, and that is not only good to eat in moderation, it increases your metabolism, but it also is nice for the skin. Then, of course, I like grass-fed animal fed, fat. Now, what's the difference between animal fat that is also said, oh my God, you shouldn't eat red meat, especially fatty cuts, they're so bad for you. That applies mostly to the animals that live in close quarters, so-called CAFOs, concentrated animal feeding organizations. And those fats contain many, many more omega-6 fatty acids, which generally are not good, and hardly any omega-3s. When you have a cow that is grain-fed, that's what happens. When you have a cow that lives outside most of the time, eats grass, and in the winter gets fed high, hay like it was for centuries, and that's what cows eat, then you have the animal fed from this cow and analyze it, and the relationship between omega-6s and 3s is about 1 to 1. Now that's quite fascinating. So it is very different, and it tastes different too. Now very good is fatty fish, and I recommend small fish that is lower on the food chain and doesn't have as many chemicals in it, like sardines, herring, mackerel, moderation salmon, especially wild caught, wild caught. The one that is ocean grown in nets often contains antibiotics and PCBs, which is not very good for you, those chemicals. If you don't like fish, you can get. Uh, nutrition through fish oil supplements like krill oil, omega-3 fatty acids. There's a few good preparations on the market. Very good for you are eggs from pasture chickens. Now there's a few happy chickens in the picture. And not good is eggs if you eat too many of the standard cage fed, grain fed only chickens. Chickens for one, it's cruel, and for second, the eggs are not as nutritious as anybody knows that tried a pastured egg and saw the orange yolks. And the chickens like to eat not only grains, but they like to forage. They like to run around and scratch and pick and flap, flap their wings, and they should be allowed to do that. And even in so-called free-range operations, they often force and cram the chickens uh, in. Uh, inside a barn and there's a door somewhere whether they find it or not i don't know and they have to often uh, cut off, off the beak because they will injure each other and they have to cut off the wings so they don't flap around and injure each other so that's a sad story i like chickens that are allowed to roam free as much as possible then good fats are nuts and seeds in moderation you all had heard of the good flaxseed and flaxseed oil, whereas flaxseed oil should be always consumed fresh, if at all, and kept in the freezer, which applies to all uh, nut oils because they get rancid very fast and then they not only taste bad, they're actually no longer good for you. Now, what do I consider bad fats? It's of course, we all know about the trans fatty acids. And the industrial oils, I don't like them either. Even canola oil, uh, 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 corn oil, sunflower oil that you get in cheap in the supermarket is often rancid and they deodorize it with chemicals so you don't taste that it's rancid. It tastes like nothing and it's really of no nutrition in it and it contains even inflammatory chemicals. Now trans fatty acids, they are found mostly in fried food, commercially baked goods, processed food and margarine. 
Now, what did they do when the trans fats came out? It's so bad for you. They took it all out. It says, oh, trans fat free, 0% trans fats. But when you look on the label, you often see that there is modified fats, modified so-and-so, modified steric acid, modified palmitoyl acid, modified this one. Now, nobody really knows what it is, but they have to do something to the fat to make an oil go hard. And that's what trans fats were good for, is hardness. And now they use modified fats, which they modified in a way that nobody knows what effects it has, so it, you're a guinea pig if you eat modified fats. I prefer not to do it as much as I can. Now, what's good for you? Of course, vitamins and minerals, cofactors, polyphenols, which are contained in large amounts in vegetables and fruit. Now, vegetables and fruit eat the whole color scheme. Eat them purple, there's radicchio, there's it's purple, there's uh, eggplants, there's zucchini, dark leafy greens like bok choy, even more main salad, or field greens are good for you. Of course, carrots, nice and orange, and tomatoes and peppers in all colors. That is good food. And then fruit is good in moderation. Too much sugar is not good for you, and fruit contains sugar. So I recommend generally avoiding fruit juice. If you want some fruit juice, buy 100% fruit juice and thin it down with water as much as you can. So you drink mostly water and not the sugar in the juice. Don't get any food blends. Look on the label, there's mostly sugar in it. For example, if you have cranberry blend, that is mostly sugar water with a little cranberry taste. But when you eat the fruit whole, the sugar in it gets attenuated in a way, gets uh, lessened by the fiber in it, and you resorb it slower, and it has less harmful effects on your sugar levels in the body and on your insulin levels, uh, which shouldn't be too high. Insulin is a growth factor and is uh, not good for the body in too much amount. And of course, if possible, financial and uh, from the season, eat organic, local, in season, fresh. And if you can't get it like that, at least frozen. I recommend not to eat too much canned vegetables and food if you can do it. And of course, it has financial considerations. So every individual has to decide. And I wrote a little ebook that you can get if you want it. And uh, I uh, wrote what to eat, what not to eat, and I classified the food in best and acceptable and avoid. <laughs> That's just my take on it. Now, what is a leaky gut? Leaky gut, many of you heard the word, and it's often caused by microorganisms which are in the stomach and go through if you eat, if your stomach acid is not functioning or you have too many pathogenic, which is uh, disease-causing uh, microorganisms. And then what happens is those organisms and other food stuff, like chemicals in your food and toxins that you really don't want to eat too much of, they get actually uh, into the microbiota here, the biome, microbiome, which is bacteria in the gut, and I'll talk about that in lesson four, in session four. And they cause those tight junctions between the cells to loosen up. And there are suddenly bigger gaps. And what happens is that the uh, bacterial proteins, especially inflammatory lipoproteins, and other food particles that are really too big to be digested, get through those big gaps. And they get looked at by the immune cells. And the immune cells say, what is that? I don't recognize it. That's foreign. I have to fight it. And that is the basis for inflammation. And stress, infections, antibiotics, poor diet, it all can cause it. And I'll have more about that later in the microbiome seminar.
uh, the inflammatory substances produced by the immune cells because of all those foreign cells cross the blood brain barrier, cause neuroinflammation and can cause all kinds of neurologic and uh, psychiatric diseases. So it, it is quite interesting. Hippocrates said, and I noticed that in the first session, all disease begins in the gut. Boy, he was right. Now, the last one I wanted to touch today are drug muggers. What are drug muggers? Those are drugs that stop nutrients from entering your body or change your body so that it does not absorb the nutrients good. And we already talked a little bit about acid blockers, especially the proton pump inhibitors like Nexium, Prilosec. They change the acid balance in the whole gut especially the stomach, if you take enough proton pump inhibitors, you have no acid left. And next seminar, actually, I will talk about why heartburn is really not caused by the acid, because many people that have normal acid in their stomach don't have heartburn. So there's other reasons for that, and I'll go into detail in the next seminar. And you're welcome to come, of course, and get the recording, whatever fits in your schedule. And uh, those reduce the resorption of many nutrients. We talked about proteins, but also vitamin B12. A possible help is use cranberry juice with it because it increases the acid a little bit. It can help a little bit, but it, it's really not a good idea to take acid blockers long term. Yes, they work fast if you have uh, an ulcer or something. Take them for a few weeks and taper off. Don't just stop them, taper it off. If you just stop them after you took them for a while, you get a rebound effect and it gets even worse than before. Now, we probably know acetaminophen, which is our Tylenol, attacks the liver to so avoid alcohol with it and it's the most common reason for liver failure, for acute liver failure, for somebody to end up in the hospital because they overdosed in it. And there is an antidote, which is n acetylcysteine And they give that in a hospital in those cases. When you take it early enough, it helps. Now, blood pressure and heart drugs, they may cause potassium and other mineral level changes not only potassium, calcium, magnesium, sodium. So that's, you have to watch it. Then hormones, especially steroids, change the metabolism in the gut and in the body, and they can affect mineral levels too, and other enzymes and everything. Antibiotics, we all heard about it, that you shouldn't use them if not absolutely necessary. And I'm not against regular medication, not at all. If your doctor says you need them, take them. But antibiotics affect the gut bacteria, the microbiome, which we'll talk about in seminar four. And that affects the nutrient levels that get absorbed. And that's quite interesting. And I always recommend if you have to take antibiotics, please take a probiotic with it at least two hours apart or use Saccharomyces boulardii, which is uh, antibiotic resistant. And after these antibiotic course is over, build your microbiome back up with probiotics like sauerkraut, raw sauerkraut. It's a very cheap, very good probiotic. Not everybody can have it, but it's worth a try. Now, Cholesterol drugs, for example, the statins, which is, for example, Lipitor, they lower the coenzyme Q10 levels and other levels. So that's quite important for heart health, for kidney health. So it's, it's better to change your diet. Maybe you don't need the cholesterol drugs. Many people wouldn't if they changed their diet accordingly. And of course, there's many other drugs that influence nutrition and uh, digestion and absorption. Smoking does, alcohol does, toxins, everything you eat. If you eat cheese with, that changes your microbiome. And I hate cheese with. It's For me, it's not a food. It's an edible matter. Now, thank you very much for listening.
We are coming to the end of me. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact me. My website is up here, visit it, and I'm always grateful for questions, comments, and constructive criticism. <laughs> and the next seminar will be about heartburn, heartache, and stomach ulcers, and the different views of different diseases. So that will be interesting. I hope you can join me. Those seminars will be uh, always the second Thursday of the month which will be March 9th for this seminar. Now we come to the end of everything and uh, let me stop the screen share and I can see if anybody needs anything, not right now. So I'm happy you watched and I wish you a wonderful night and hopefully we don't get too much snow. All right. Goodbye, everybody. Bye-bye. I stop the recording now.